I had no intention of ever wearing this hat. I have to prepare myself because I, um, it does have, it is, a, it's powerful. And um, I've seen some really incredible things in, in, my, in my work that I do with that. And I think even some, some places we've been where we've seen the work of spirit happen because we do things in a very spiritual, collective way. The place that we're, we're at is called Nana Bojang. And this is a very sacred place. For me, I think of this area to a large degree as the center of creation. There's many different perspectives on how humans came to be and where they are in their world. But for us, this particular place is the center of the universe. It's the center of the world. The teaching lodge, it's like the main objective. Like, that's the thing that you have to build. It's quiet, so you can hear people talking. You listen. Our traditional beliefs and our traditional life that our ancestors uh, have left for us to live by, so that's one of the key things that we do to remind ourselves of how life should be, the pace of the world, the pace of Mother Nature, Mother Earth. And they like do ceremonies like this. Uh, Sunrise ceremony. Get your get day it. started up good. So you're like feel relaxed and all. Yeah, like. Good for the day, ready for the day. Yeah, like a morning prayer. When I wear this, I have to make sure that I'm of kind mind, kind body, kind spirit. It doesn't make us perfect. It doesn't make us the kindest or the best person to be walking around that day. But for that moment when you're smudging, that moment you are perfect. It doesn't mean 15 minutes later I ain't going to be swearing about something or you know what I mean? After that, you hope that you have a good day. When people say you practice the culture, practice. You act, that's what you're doing. You're practicing. You're, 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 you can make those little mistakes and uh, but it's all with the aim of of being better and getting better and at some point it's not practicing you're just that's just the way you are i've done it pretty much every day now i'm pretty sure yeah okay. yeah wait no not every day if you want to be good at carpentry well you put in hours if you want to be good at being anishinaabe you have to put in your hours Consider the drum our, our grandfather. That's uh, so. When, when we refer to the drum, we usually speak him as like a grandfather, as a hymn, or uh, you know, rather than it or uh, an instrument. It's it's more of a our our grandfather. You know, we try to respect him. We don't put our uh, you know, even when our kids are around, we don't have their toys on the on the drum. It's just for the drumsticks and uh, whatever else. You know, heating him up, making sure he's comfortable and well respected. Our strength comes from our ancestors. When the eagle flies, he'll fly straight up. The eagle flies the highest of all the birds. And the eagle actually goes right to the spirit world and takes all our prayers to the spirit world. They're kind of like angels. 
like the angels of God, like their messengers of the Creator is kind of like God, but the natives call God the Creator. So... And in our teachings, each one of those feathers is one of our ancestors. It's, a, it's its own spirit. So this hat has all these spirits here that are here that have come to help me do the work that I do as the chief of the First Nation. For my people here in Batchewana, for and and I and I say that with trepidation because I'm I'm just one of us, and it just so happens that right now I have some responsibility to speak on our behalf in some areas with some limited license. We've been married in '46. Forty-six years we've been married. No, we got married in '46. Yeah. Part of my role is to help in the re-evolution of a vision of where we need to be going. We are just like all of those other beings out there. We're all spirit. We have to remember our place, our connectedness to the rest of the universe. We're spiritual beings having a, a human experience right now. To Native people, everything has a spirit. Do we really believe that rock has a feeling? No, but it has an existence in, in our world. That's, when you believe that, you treat them different. That's a part of being Anishinaabe. That's a part of being Ojibwe. Protecting our heritage and our culture, no matter how big or how small it is. Even in the smallest of ways, it has the biggest of meaning. Even if it's a simple matter of putting a little bit of tobacco on, by a tree, or putting some on the water before you go out and set your nets. Whenever I go fishing, I put down some some sema, some tobacco, and you know, give thanks for being able to be alive and enjoy, you know, uh, everything that's here and possibly the fish that I might catch um, because, you know, the, the teaching or lesson that I've always been taught is that, uh, you know, we put back what we take from, from, from this world. One ceremony maker I met tried to explain to somebody what Anishinaabe means. And there's a lot of you know, stories about that word Nishinaabe means. That's what we call ourselves, Anishinaabe. And I liked his answer, because what that means is we ask everything we ask, you know, before we take something, before we do something. If we want to take some water for, to wash or to cook or food or an animal, we ask that first. If we're going to be developing a communal natural resource project, let's say we're going to do a wind farm. The first thing we do, wherever that area is, is we'll have a ceremony and we'll ask our ancestors if that's an okay initiative to do there. And then we'll go out there with our hunters and we'll go out there with our fishermen and we'll ask them what's in this area. Is there anything we need to be aware of? Right now you're in the Bow Lake wind farms. From the Batwana point of view, they are 50% owners in this project. So from the revenue made from the, from the electricity sold, uh, our band will benefit. You know, I come outside, I put my sema down, I said prayers for all of these trees, as did a lot of other Anishinaabe people from this site. We don't want to impede, we don't want to impose. We want to make sure that continuation of, of our lifestyle isn't going to be affected by the project. This will generate something for our future generations. That's what fills me with excitement. It's not making a paycheck every two weeks. That's, that's not what it is. It's thinking of, thinking of my family yet to come, thinking of my grandkids. So we work with the water. We work with the land. We work with the trees. They're all our relatives because in one way or another, we're all connected.
When the settlers first came here, we were already fairly progressive in our management of natural resources. We managed copper and we traded copper throughout North America. We also managed the forests. We had intertribal trade routes. We traded medicines from our lands. We traded fish. We managed the natural resources in their entirety. And we did that in sustainable ways. We lived in harmony with our land. We lived in harmony with the environment. Our relationship with the land, uh, it's a special one. It's always been. Uh, we're here facing the Anishinaabe Chigaming. In our language, that means uh, this is the Ojibwe Ocean. This has been our, our highway for uh, time beyond memory. This is where we make our life, or our ancestors made their living from. And this is what informs our, our identity and our culture. In the native community, they have a different view of ownership, particularly land. We don't say like, I own this land. It's more, I'm responsible for what happens with this land. We don't see the land as a Separate. A separate thing or a property that subject to our whims. We say the land owns us. We're half of the land and we're half of the sky. When we die, our bodies go back to the earth. Our other half, that goes back to the sky. Our villages were really everybody's village everybody's land and if you needed some land you used some land you only took what you needed and then if you didn't need any other land somebody else could use it so it's a use of land not an ownership of land in the capital of the site that piece of land is theirs a native person wants to go over to somewhere and he passes through the white man's land it's, he's trespassing he can't even walk on it because it's private property. That's a whole different concept. Canada is trying really hard to impose that system of fee simple or private ownership of chunks of land. And it's such a challenge for our people to, to work within the confines of, of structured land allocations. The other view is, this is where I live, you know. And it, you want to come see it, come and walk on it, come and... Oh, this is fresh. Fresh. Just curling in the pan. The terminology of ownership and possession is hard to explain in English. I would say. Even if you've, you were raised speaking English, and that there is still that hesitation gap, like, because First Nation people, when you talk about something, you're describing it. Like a strawberry is like not just a strawberry, it is a red, round heart with a green on top. So when you say it, like when you go like an Ottoman Kwa, like, you know, that's, that's a strawberry woman. It's describing who that person is, not just saying, oh, that's a woman. Even just, well, using the English language to describe a lot of this takes a lot of effort. How do you exactly define ownership? Some of our elders remember the first time that they seen a fence. We did have a um, division of lands, but it wasn't with fences or any of those. It was with mountains was a, a landmark. Rivers were, there were natural things that people knew. So it wasn't represented by physical man-made structures, but there was a, a respect between mm -hmm. a people that this particular family or family group utilized this either this river system or this hunting ground or this part along the coast, this river mouth. Even, uh, even today in our community, when somebody gets a moose, they'll put it out there like we got three moose this year that were given to us and anybody in the community could come and get moose meat. Honey, 
when there was the developers that came from from Europe they came here with the mind to extricate uh, minerals natural resources and really didn't even see us here they didn't recognize that there were people here already we were not confrontational we were very peaceful people because of how we are because of our nature and our cultural belief we share people come to your territory you invite them in and if they want to live next door if nobody's using that land yeah go ahead and use it the original expectation when the visitors came here was that we would stay in our canoe and in our canoe would be our language our economy our spirituality our management systems our resources we would continue to manage all of those things in our canoe and in a ship the europeans the the, the settlers came here and they would manage their systems they would manage whatever they have but never would we ever get into each other's ships and those ships would travel the river of life side by side and never would we interfere in each other's business we would always be able to maintain our own indigenous governance systems social systems which when them my thoughts are full of thanks it is from the word me gwen which means to give but when you say thank you you are receiving something that's given to you so you're sort of honoring that gift eh me we you guys can oh, come in there's our fisherman yeah yeah <laughs> that's really good do you wish for the peace i will there was an Ojibwe nation at one time there that covered probably a quarter of Canada and part of the States. Somewhere from the Dakotas to the French River and the East and headwaters of the Great Lakes. The relationship of, uh, of bands pre-treaty is a lot different than it is today. Our nations of people, let's say, let's, let's call ourselves a nation for, for this instance that was spread out amongst a, a vast territory and had a loose social network of families, of community groupings. But to somebody just coming in, you know, one day and seeing, well, there's a bunch of people here, and then 100 miles away, up a, up a river, there's another bunch of Indians over here. Well, they must be distinct communities. They didn't understand that this was actually a homogenous group of people but with a very different way of relating to one another because we would gather you know in times of need so it was a very sophisticated functioning society that we had we have villages all along the northeast east shore of lake superior you know the population started building more people kept coming in and next thing you know, you start getting disputes over, over land. So, okay, we got to fix this so they have a treaty. The British uh, had made treaties with our forefathers, first of all, for economic purposes. In 1850, the Crown needed to meet with the chiefs in order to continue their mining operations in the area or or being able to license mining companies to, to take iron ore and copper ore out of, out of our land. We said, we don't mind sharing that with you, but we're going to share it with you and we're going to benefit from them too. We expect to get an annuity. That was to come out of the money, the value of the resources. They're going to take 50% of it and they're supposed to provide us with supports. That was what is supposed to happen. We accepted these visitors uh, with open arms, provided them with uh, food, shelter, uh, resources, and things like that. And uh, what we wanted in return was that it was the same, to live uh, you know, peacefully amongst each other and to uh, 
uh, not be, uh, you know, taken advantage of. Obviously, I think there were some assumptions that they were going to do it in a sustainable way and we'd be able to trust and that we'd be able to see the continuation of our beautiful lands in the way that we've been able to manage it, but that wasn't the case. To say that they just come over and took over, they did, but by a process that had a life of its own, I think. Our nation reached all extents of North America at one point. That all became subject to a line, imaginary line being drawn right through the middle of our territory. Because the US, the United States at that time treated our brothers differently on that side and the British treated us differently here on this side, <clears throat> which divided our nation into half. Divide and conquer, I think that's part of a long-term term of government's way of doing things. September 9, 1850, we set out a chunk of land that was approximately 150 miles long and inland to the height of land where the water flows into Lake Superior. That was the area that we had set aside for our sole benefit and use, to use in the habit of, that we were in the habit of doing. This, this entire area, as far as you can see, in any direction, was the, was the land, or we still considered our land. Each of these groups of Anishinaabe people would have their lands protected, as well as their way of life and the way of making a living in exchange for these companies to continue taking the ore out off the land. That's what our ancestors understood. Over time, there was horrendous uh, difficulties with the settlers, and it led to a lot of illegal actions on the part of the settler government, and they actually uh, stole most of that land. Let's talk about going back to the treaties, not only the treaties, but our, how valid are these treaties? What was our original agreements? What, what did we agree to? It's two conflicting ways of life. And then you try to negotiate something without defining those differences. How could a treaty ever be properly written? People were signing off on treaties and they had no idea what they were signing. It was in a foreign language, and, and uh, that was what was presented as the, the agreement. I, they are valid as, as agreements, but the understanding of what was being done at the time by both sides. It was a willing process. We were told, you have to sign this, and this is what you're going to get. They weren't made with, you know, native lawyers, you know, or native legislatures. There are so many loopholes. There's a huge disparity about the interpretation of how we were going to share. And, and I say, well, that's not our version. That's the colonizing government, the settler governments. That's their summary of what it was. All of a sudden, we get an eviction notice and saying, now you're going to be a part of this land. I was like, but this was all of our land. Canada, their first major illegal act was July 1st, 1867. That's when they became a country, to some degree. What the Canadian parliamentary system did was they decided to meet with the provinces and sort out who's going to make decisions about different things. The first Prime Minister of Canada said, I hereby declare I'm going to look after Indians and lands reserved for Indians. Well, that 
really upset us because you can't unilaterally say you're going to look after us now. We reserved our sovereignty, our jurisdiction, our rights that were set out in treaties. He can't extinguish those things. I don't like to use the word Indian because we're not Indians, we're Anishinaabek. Indians are people that are from the other side of the world. And uh, Columbus, uh, 1492, he washed ashore here somewhere and we rescued him. But somehow it sounds as though he discovered us. And he thought he was in India, he thought he made it to India, the shortcut to India, but he was lost. Keen winters, and there's Nicholas in. Betsy, there's Nicholas. Murray, there's Nicholas in. Well, I really like being around people whose first language is their native language. It's one of the most difficult languages in the world because it deals with living and non living as opposed to, say, with the French, feminine and masculine. They have to translate in their mind not just the terms, but the concepts into, into an English language so you can understand them. All their lives in Botswana, right in the same spot the whole time now. We didn't understand me, I told you all the time in Indian. <laughs> And in our language, they say uh, the reserve, or what, what they call it today, it's interpreted as leftovers. That's, how, that's what it means in the language. It's just the leftovers. That's what uh, the, the settler governments left us. I think I was in grade one or kindergarten. I was that young. And we were on a bus, and we were going to some attraction. You know, they take the kids out of the school for a morning or something. And then the teacher, was, I remember, was announcing stuff over the PA on the bus. And she said, next is, you'll find we're going to go through the, uh, the Indian reservation. So I got excited. Wow, we're going to see teepees, you know, we're going to see <laughs> something looking out. And we're just, we just went through our reserve and we passed by my house. And I'm, I'm looking around for these teepees. I didn't realize they were talking about where I lived. <laughs> I was pretty disappointed. The reserves were run by an Indian agent. Priests and, and, and religious orders; those were the two biggest influences on the reserves, you know, from from outside. Over time, we as a people, anything and everything that we ever needed, we'd have to go to the Indian agent's house and knock on his door and say, "Can I do this? Can I go here today? Can I go to the doctor? Can I go and see this?" People had to get a ticket, a permit from the Indian agent to actually physically leave those imaginary borders and be allowed to go into town or to go hunting or go on the lake. I have a social insurance number and I have a status number. When I'm born, I'm given another number and that's my number that identifies me for the government of Canada that says I am a First Nations person of Batchewana First Nation. Can you tell me of another group of people that needed to be recognized by their government, by a number, from just being that part of that culture, or just being from that population? Jewish people had to have a number. And they were given that number. And they were controlled with that number. And they were identified with that number, and not just by their name. So as a person of Canada, as a citizen of Canada, I also have another number that's recognized by a government who controls what I can and can't get access to. The idea was to keep the Indians all in a small place so we could civilize and convert them to Christianity or whatever else they wanted to do. So living on a reserve kind of served th their purpose. This antiquated reserve system is not in any way meant to benefit us. It was to take us away from all of the resources. Instead of this powerful, broad-reaching network of, of communities composing a nation was basically broken down to individual, more secularized uh, municipalities. So that's how all these individual bands, Batchewana Band, Batchewana First Nation, Garden River First Nation, Mishpacotton First Nation, 
became all these individual political entities. There are over 600 First Nation reserves in, in Canada. The current structure of First Nation governments in Canada today is legislated by the federal government. Today, um, for our leadership systems in our community, uh, the chief and the council, the decisions aren't made like they would have historically been made. It's an imposed governance system. It's a very archaic governance system. It's, uh, it's imposed legislation. It's called the Indian Act. It's how Indians are supposed to act in Canada. And, um, and it's not aligned with our historic systems. Prior to that, chiefs, as we call them, weren't chiefs. They were, as one elder put it, the kindest one of the bunch. Usually that's the one you didn't have nothing because everything he had, people would come because they needed something and he'd give it to them. But with the imposition of the Indian Act, it made it an elected position almost like an administrative position. That person had the voice, could speak for everybody here. That wasn't a part of our culture one time. In our lodges, everybody had a voice. So everybody's input could be gathered before you know, the community made a decision. Things have changed. Our whole political dynamic has changed. And I don't think it was intended for us to succeed, the Indian Act. There is a, a thing that's uh, been thrown upon us through legislation to the Canadian government that uh, I call it legislated genocide. It's in regards to who determines who we are, who is a native person. As the lands were developed and there was benefits reaped from those lands, each person from Batuana would receive an annual payment as their share of the natural resource extractions every year Canada at that same time said, in order to do that properly, we need to look after the numbers. We need to look after who is an Indian or who's recognized. And as soon as they got a hold of the list, they started taking, oh, this one shouldn't be there, this one shouldn't be there. And under this legislation, when the blood uh, is determined that you're only a quarter blood or less, then uh, you're no, no longer recognized as a native person. And, uh, and this thing, uh, this legislation is forced upon us and we don't, certainly don't agree with it. Eventually, uh, if, if it stays the way it is, it's structured the way it is, there will be no native people left. We'll be legislated out of existence. Canada today still tries to look after the list of who's an Indian and they fight us tooth and nail in their own courts to try and not recognize us. Because of the, the federal law that defined who and, who and what an Indian is and how you go from being an Indian to being not an Indian, uh, that has been in place for so long that it really confused our people as far as our identity. The population of Batuana is uh, about 27 to 2,800 people. And that's um, throughout all over the world. 
I'd say upwards to 1,200 of our members live within an hour of Sault Ste. Marie. Sault Ste. Marie is a city of about uh, 80,000 people. So when you talk about feeling out of place, you know, that, that place used to be ours. That place used to be where we used to get our food from. Now it's dammed up. There's a big steel mill on that, on that river. To feel like an alien walking down there, of, of course, I, I believe most Anishinaabe people do. Trying to bring the Anishinaabe into a city, that's so hard to do because we have a connection with the land. You know, in my opinion, that's where a lot of the drinking and alcohol abuse comes from and drug abuse comes from is because there's something that they're missing, something that they're longing. And when you lose connection with where you're from, you need to fill that void with something. There's nothing in town that shows that we, we were there. And there's nothing that shows that we are here. They have to understand the history of this area. They have to understand it wasn't just the uh, settlers of, uh, of Europe uh, that came here and uh, set up shop here in Sault Ste. Marie. None of that would exist without our uh, ability to share through our treaties and things like that. Hello, Henri Beaujau. I'm from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Born and raised in uh, Rankin Reserve, part of Batchewana First Nation. I think for me, individually, I, I do walk in the both worlds. For me growing up, I was never raised in a traditional household. Uh, my parents weren't in tune with their culture or their, or their traditions. I was like, well, what does it mean to be Native? I had a nan, and she's like, well, it's different for everybody. For you, your story is going to be a lot different compared to mine. It was hard living on the reserve, is, um, being openly gay. Courage is being yourself every day in a world that tells you to be someone else. As of January 2014, gay marriage has been legalized in 17 states in America. And in Canada, it is also legal to marry the same sex. I believe that this is important and empowering because everyone deserves equal rights and should be able to marry the one they love. When I was growing up, I have I have friends and cousins who are openly gay and they always told me about the two-spirited people. It's when like um, a man or woman has the spirit of both sexes. Not having that essence or not having that knowledge of my own history, it was hard to find that connection. It was hard to find my place. Um, doing my own research about two-spirited people on Turtle Island. We were held in high regard in so many different cultures when it comes to indigenous people of this land. Um, we were teachers, we were shamans, we were uh, healers, we were, po we were political leaders. And in other communities, we were just a part of the community. Within my community, within this area, within this territory, we lost that somewhere. I don't know where we lost it. And when I ask the questions to traditional teachers, they either don't know or it's a, something, it's a subject topic that they don't talk about. And these are for people who are not only traditionalized, but also people who are very connected into uh, Christianity and religion, which is, again, another aspect of um, European colonization. Uh, there was a, a period of time, my dad's time, his dad's, his dad before him, that it was outlawed here in Canada that you couldn't practice a lot of the old ways that uh, that we could now. Um, and that had an impact on how our culture evolved or stopped evolving. <clears throat> it really caused a lot of confusion when there was this movement by the Christians to come in and uh, change our belief systems and impose another system on us. So it was really a challenge for us for for a long time to be able to understand uh, who we were.
Well, the hardships was uh, in our early years when we were going to school. That was the hardest. All Native people were treated as wards, mm -hmm. as orphans, uh, in terms of the legal context in Canada. There was a lot of uh, misguided uh, policies. The residential school thing, that's just, that weighs heavy on people, and a lot of them don't want to talk about it. My grandmother attended residential school for nine years in Spanish, Ontario. That, and I didn't even know that happened until she had passed away. I was not there and my parents were not there. And I consider that a blessing for my family. It was basically a policy set by uh, the Canadian government at the time to force First Nations children to attend these institutional complexes that were run by state and church to assimilate them into the European colonies' education and infrastructure. But at the same time, erasing that cultural identity of being First Nations or Indigenous to the people of this land. It was a government policy to deal with what they perceived as the Indian problem. My generation over, but that was stolen on us, you know, the, you know, through the residential school and... When kids and families were disrupted by the removal of their kids, uh, we lost a lot. And kids were forced to go to these schools without their, without consent or without other people's knowledge. Parents didn't have a choice. A plane would land. They'd scoop the children to crying parents. You can just imagine your child, three or four years old, being taken from your arms, literally. You never see them again, a lot of them. Or if you do, you don't recognize them because they're 16, 17. They've already been raised by other people. because just hearing the stories of the survivors that attended these schools. The first day you get there, they just douse you in this chemical because they think that you're native, you got lice, you got bugs, so, and they scrubbed you down. You were punished if you spoke your language. The main policy, the main policy of residential school was to uh, take the Indian out of the Indian. You hear stories of residential schools where sterilization took place for a lot of students. Kids were sexually abused and physically abused and emotionally and mentally abused. Many kids ran away trying to get back home. And there was a lot of tragedy that way. When a child would die, when a student would die, they were prepped not by the teachers and not by the people that worked there. A lot of times it was like their own peers, other kids, wrapping up other kids and carrying them and taking them to the church and to the chapel. Kids were not even sent home if they died at residential school. Like if these walls could talk. You might hear some tears.
So our old people always said the government knew what they were doing. When they wanted to, to kill the Indian, that's what they did when they took the children away. And that ran from the late 1800s right until 1997 when the last uh, day school for residential school was closed in Canada. That kind of trauma and that kind of horrible issues or abuse still played a role for those students afterwards. When they got home, there was people who were a part of their identity was erased and then them trying to be included back into the community was a lot harder for them. My dad, when he came back to his community, he didn't feel, feel like he belonged. So from there, he went to the Navy. From the Navy, he went, he worked at like, um, Algoma Steel, and from there, like we, we lived in town pretty well half my life before we moved back to the community. And when we moved back to the community, I know I can speak for myself, I didn't have that connection with my community. For my grandmother, when she came back, the only people she really identified with or was able to talk to and feel comfortable with were other people who went to residential school with her. I had a friend who I went back to his community up north and said he was an electrician. But the community had no electricity. Our generation has a different perspective than the generations previous to us in that we didn't go to residential school. We didn't go through that trauma. And it's not to say that we're not affected by that. I think there's still very much a lot of uh, terrible things that are associated with that today that can still be felt. It had tr tremendous, horrendous effect on our people uh, for a number of generations. And again, and I, and again, it's different for everybody, but to figure out what that meant for me as um, our second generation residential school survivor. Mike Kakaji, who is an elder within the community here, he uh, was doing a speak and he said that residential schools uh, were not a place for First Nation students to be raised as parents. They were raised as supervisors. It's regimented. It, you're in a, just like a concentration camp. And I can understand it from my own family background, with my father and my aunt, that they were, don't remember too many hugs. They don't remember being very warm. It was very rigid. It was very constructive. A lot of our kids and parents even today don't know how to hug, can't say the word love. So, it's been absent. What if it's two generations that's been absent? It just takes more time. But the general public is unaware of it because it's not pretty history. And so it's not, it's not taught in the curriculum until very recently. Algoma University used to be a residential school, a part of Canada's history, a part, that part of Canada's own genocide that doesn't get mentioned upon. The local one here at Shingwok, they have a graveyard. And there are unmarked graves. And there are so many people in Sault Ste. Marie that don't even know that it's there. And there's First Nations people who don't know what a residential school is. I was familiar with residential schools um, since I was 15 years old, volunteering at a, a local residential school gathering that happens here at Algoma University. Every time I walk into that Algoma University, I get that feeling. Once you're in that hallway and you think, oh my goodness, that feeling kind of comes back to you. 
it created the opportunity for me to go back and teach my parents about a residential school was. To bring them to the gatherings so they could see the pictures of those children hanging on those walls. But that one time we went to a reunion there, me and my brother and my younger brother, and they said, see Dolly, we can step in, we can step out. I said, all right, let's go in. We can come back up. Well, in 2011, June 2011, uh, Canada's Prime Minister made an apology to us for what Canada had done to us in the last 140 years with the forced um, systemic elimination of Indigenous people through the residential schools. I went to Ottawa and I was in the House of Commons and I wanted to see it for myself. So. I wanted to get, uh, not only hear it for myself, but I wanted to feel what all those other Native people in the, sitting in the cheap seats were feeling at the same time. He apologized uh, in 2011, and that was the extent of it. There was no, this is how we're gonna do things any better. The language is almost gone. And the biggest part of our culture is based on our language. First Nations people, Indigenous people are very uh, or, or, oral traditional people. We never wrote anything down. It went passed by generation to generation. Today we only, we figure we only have uh, 14 speakers left. And that again goes back to, you know, the days when our culture was suppressed. We weren't allowed to speak our language. Their speakers yeah. are aging mm -hmm. and they're getting out of the system and we have to rejuvenate it. And even if we do try to teach the language in, in the schools, there's no community for them to go back to the to maintain that language. There's no other place in the world where you could get our language. The world loses out on the language as well, not just the Aboriginal people. Mm. We live side by side with Sault Ste. Marie, and you would think there'd be a lot more tolerance uh, because people would be more educated about First Nations because they're living so closely and amongst them. Um, but sometimes it's the exact opposite. There's a lot of uh, negativity towards First Nations. You know, we just built some we built some very nice lodges in Sault Ste. Marie, right, right on Whitefish Island, to show Sault Ste. Marie what it is to be Anishinaabe, how it was to live in Anishinaabe with our birch bark lodges. It takes a lot of time to assemble these. Um, as you can see, it's hand stitched and it's birch bark covered. People went there and destroyed it, you know. Threw rocks through it and broke it all up. And, you know, we're trying to show the beauty of things, too. I think it's just an ignorance as opposed to knowing 
or, you know, again, it all leads back to education and how important it is to know our histories before you judge someone. You know, it's, it's just so ironic that, that this is a place of, of teaching and promoting knowledge and what's come of it is, you know, the exact opposite of what it's supposed to be about. If I went downtown and did that to a church, well, it'd be all over the news. Racism is, is so evident and so hurtful, and our kids see it. It's all over the city. A lot of our kids experience racism within sports, within their schools, uh, within the stores. And it's systemic, Canadian, legalistic discrimination and racism that we're, we're facing. For example, they just pulled a young native 15-year-old uh, uh, girl out of uh, a river in Winnipeg. If that would have been a non-native woman or not a non-native girl that went missing a week ago, you would, it would have been front page all over the news, right across Canada. But because it's a native, no uh, uh, minimal coverage. We have right now about 1,200 murdered and missing women in the last number of years that, that, that have never been resolved. Loretta Saunders was a master's university student and she was doing her thesis on missing and an indigenous, missing and murdered Indigenous women. And she ended up becoming one of her own statistics. More than a statistic with much more to give. Still teaching, still helping, murdered, but never forgotten. Our people have been trying to call for an inquiry for murdered and missing women, but the government says, there's no need to call an inquiry. Canada has swamped our canoe. We had our culture, we had our way of living, and then we lost it. And we didn't just lose it because we lost it, we were, it was taken from us. They were trying to hide us and think that the Indian problem would go away. So much was taken from us. People don't realize the conditions that are here, right in Canada, that uh, need to be addressed. There's no reason for us in one of the most wealthiest countries in the world that we have our people that are barely making it to a life expectancy of 60. Not even anywhere close to Canadians' life expectancy rate. We have five times higher incident rates of diabetes. We have five times higher rates of addictions. We have five times higher incident rates of youth suicide. We have a lot of social problems, a lot of unemployment issues. It bugs me so much, and it bugs me when people still say, why do you want more? From 1854 to around 1954, it was illegal for us to take Canada to court in regards to their treatment of us. It was illegal for us to hire a lawyer. It was illegal for us to get a copy of the agreements that we made with them. It's not that we want more. We just want the acknowledgement to know of how much we've lost and how for so many of us, we don't even know what we've lost. We, we did our, our in integrating. We're, we're speaking English, I don't know my language. For the indigenous women who get murdered and go missing, about the First Nations youth who still get lost along the way now, trying to find themselves and trying to find out what their identity is. It's just unethical, it's immoral, it's illegal. What Canada is doing to First Nations. Bring back those voices that we lost in residential school. We're 
we're not Canada's Indians. We're not Canadian Indians. We're not American Indians. We are Anishinaabe. Our relationship with Canada is not based on an absolute surrender of our lands. There are conditions attached to the sharing of the lands. And if those conditions are not met, guess who the land reverts back to? Reverts back to us. So Canada is, is renting land here from us and they're not paying the rent. We cannot endorse this any longer. We have to take control of our own destiny. Stewardship is a swear word for me. We can allow ourselves to be stewards, but we can't allow Canada to allow us to be stewards. As, as, as soon as we say to Canada, well, we'll be stewards, well, stewards on behalf of who? On behalf of Canada? No, we, 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 we can't be a steward. We are to some degree a steward for the creator, but we cannot be Canada's steward. Everything you accumulate in the capitalist world is, is wealth. What's happening by the settler governments, they take and take and take until there's no more and it's decimated. All for what? Corporate greed. It's, it's you know, uh, a big problem, especially nowadays, uh, because what, what happened now is uh, the government has kind of uh, done away with any environmental protection uh, within this country. So corporations are just allowed to go and set up shop and just do whatever the hell they want. When do we draw that line with regards to economic initiatives and capitalism? And that's why you don't see total destruction within First Nation communities because you can see all kinds of, uh, you don't see clear cutting and things like that by uh, our own people. We only move as much as we need to without having any detrimental or large effect on any of our relatives. We don't have that urge to accumulate the wealth. To... And I think that's where you start to see, you know, all kinds of demonstrations from a First Nations perspective. We've seen widespread protests within Canada and different cities about, uh, you know, a stepping up for, uh, you know, for Mother Earth. Um, we had our women and children on the front lines stopping fracking companies from the States, uh, trying to drill for gas within their areas. The other thing is when we are successful at doing things, we don't take advantage of the fact we did something, you know, pat ourselves on the back. We don't do that. We just go about doing our work, find it's a big deal. We have inherent responsibilities. We will not and cannot shrug those obligations and responsibilities. We understand what our rights are, and if Canada don't want to listen, we'll make enough noise so that the world listens, and hopefully that'll cause some shame for Canada, and they'll listen. Canada, you inherited a lot of obligations, and we'll expect those to be fulfilled. I don't see the perpetuation and the continuation of the reserve system. If anything, maybe we should put the shoe on the other foot and round up all Canadians and put them in reserves. That's, that's, a, that's an awful system, but just think about it on the other way around. If you tell that to any kind, any person who's not First Nations or anybody who is from uh, European descent, that is like, okay, we're going to come here and then we're going to take over. The, I was like, I'm going to take over your back la backyard because and get you to sign something, and say, and this is, and this is how I'm going to take it over. It's like, well, you can't do that. That's wrong. Yes, yes, it is wrong. Yes, it is wrong. This is our home. This is our homeland. Uh, we have not given up this and we have not lost it in a war. It was not a for sale item. It was not a surrender. If Canadians knew the proper history, I think there wouldn't be as much racism and angst towards First Nations for, for really just asking for what we're owed and what we deserve. You know, education and history is what gives you your identity. I have to remember my role in making sure that we honor our inheritance. And our inheritance 
is all of those Gajay Anishinaabe that were here before us. What are we leaving? And what are we gonna have seven generations in front of us? I really think that um, out of necessity, we need to educate all Canadians about the unique history that Canada has. Everybody has to have an awareness of the First Nations culture, First Nations uh, perspective, so they can be more supportive. It's not such a threat. have to take the responsibilities back as a people. And right now, it's not going to be that easy because Canada has a flawed sense of ownership of all of those things that we reserve jurisdiction over. Let's start continuing, continually pressuring, and I don't mean, you know, militantly wise. If you're going to become that defensive and become aggressive to fight aggression, it's not going to solve anything. Conflict does not solve more conflict. Through protests, through lobby efforts, through organized, you know, actions, through the courts, through uh, developing our own programs, to empowering ourselves, to healing ourselves. Let's pressure the government that way uh, to, to move things further. <laughs> Those bridges need to be connected, so. When we look at a philosophy of, of us, or the Anishinaabek, it isn't very far away from a time perspective that we were in complete alignment with our environment. The more we unite, the harder it is for the government to, to deny us things. And our canoe will once again go down that river of life with all of our things still in there. You know, my grandpa used to say, in order to find out who you are, you have to go and find those secrets, those great mysteries that those spirits are, that the Creator has left for you out there. I was sitting with him and he says, a little bird landed there and that bird was making noise and he says, hey, my son, he says, that bird has a message for you. I thought to myself, I don't speak bird. So not till years later, I'm, I was thinking about what he said about that little bird and I woke up the next morning and there was still snow on the ground and I woke up frustrated, I woke up very, very angry and I, I just wanted the snow to go away so I can get out there and start doing stuff. When I opened the door, there was a robin sitting on the tree and he started whistling and making noise. And instantly, what my, what my grandpa had told me about that bird has a message for me, it made sense to me. It was just like, you know, have some patience. Springtime is coming. And as far as where we're 
kind of going with our communities and, and our land base. And that differs from band member to band member. The way I look at it, it's really a state of mind. We have to look beyond these artificial borders that circumscribe each of these little postage sized stamps of land. Those are not our boundaries. We didn't draw those boundaries. Somebody else drew that for us <clears throat> and convinced us you have to stay within that. I don't think we should be worried about how land should be redistributed. I think the important thing is that the land is cared for and maintained. We don't need a large reserve in order to support and continue our culture at this point. Because if we come at it from a, an ownership point of view, then if we move away from our beliefs that we're part of the, we, the land owns us, to the position that we own the land, then we lost. That's where we lose. Because if we say, okay, instead of four postage stamps, now we got one great big postage stamp, that's, that would be wrong for us to do that. Because even though it's a bigger reserve, it's still made up of these imaginary boundaries. What about our responsibility to that land that falls just outside of that new line? So that's the bigger picture, I think. That's the more important question. How are we gonna to work together to keep this land new? All of those foundational elements that we have for our people, like being kind to one another, understanding the challenges of life and being wise in our contemplations and our decisions, sharing. Honesty, love, bravery, truth. and how we implement those are so important for how the rest of society and the rest of the global population should be, you know, moving forward. We need to have healthy, independent people. What we're empowering our people to do is to feel good about who you are, understand who you are, assert who you are and believe in who you are and from that we'll find justice we have the color of right
کچی هم نمیگه میگه چی نوب میگمانه دوک مابا نناتک نیوه زمان نیوه شیاغ میدهد تا Ani, ani, ani.